verse 42. And this is the story of the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples and they all began to speak in tongues and, uh, and the people around that area, they heard them in their own tongues, in their own languages. And Peter gave a message about Jesus Christ and about the offer of the Holy Spirit. And then at the end, 3,000 people were baptized on that day, on that day of Pentecost. And then in verse 42, we find that these new group of believ uh, believers, um, 3,000 plus, they devoted themselves, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe as many wonders and signs performed by the apostles, verse 44. All believers were together and had everything in common. Verse 45, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. 46, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, uh, this is sort of a, a, one of the more difficult uh, scriptures in, in the book of Acts. When, when you read commentaries about that, this, they kind of don't quite understand where to go with this. We need to understand the background of why um, these people gathered together and, and devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Why did they fellowship? Why did they break bread? And how did they break bread? And what was the purpose of their prayer? And how did they pray? We need to ask those questions. And one of the questions that I asked when going through this, and this guy's in um, with, with a question about how, how, how was the economy of that group of 3,000 plus believers? In verse 44, all the believers were together and had everything in common. And some of those who are, were anti-communists, they said, that's Christian communism. No, they had everything in common. That's, that's not right. That's not the way to go. Um, verse 45, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And one of the things, you know, the body of Christ kind of disagrees about everything. Right? The body of Christ disagrees about everything. Yesterday I was just with a bunch of, a group of people. Um, they had United Church of Christ people, there, there were disciples of Christ, there were Presbyterians, there were Baptists, there were like a whole bunch of Protestants all together in one house. And I met with them and shared a bunch of things because uh, they asked me to. And they understand, they understood, or they understand that when, when Christians get together, there's bound to be this and I'm sure that when we get together and talk about some of the things that we believe in, there's going to be, there's going to be disagreement, right, Glenn? I like this one. It's not because Glenn is the reason. He just likes to smile at me. Thank you. But there's always bound to be disagreement. And as one, there was one movie that I saw decades ago, and they said, where there are three Jews, there's bound to be four opinions. <laughs> and I said, well, oh, hold on. You know, where there are four Christians, there's bound to be five opinions. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Do you know what? When all, when Christians read verse 44 and verse 45, there seems to be a unanimous universal agreement that this is something that we don't do. This is something we don't do. You can ask any Christian, they'll probably say, oh, well, that was for them. That was not for us. Let's look at the background. This is Pentecost. If you remember Pentecost, that's 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, or Passover, depending on which commentary you read. 50 days, right? Five, zero, remember that? 
Now this is the inauguration of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The inauguration of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to Luke chapter 4, verses 18 to 21. This one is about the inauguration of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Jesus had been going through the towns in, in Israel and had been healing the sick. And then he goes to his hometown, goes to one of their synagogues on a Saturday. And as their custom was, they would ask certain people to come up to the front and read the scroll, which was the first panel of verse of the day, and then teach. So Jesus came up and read verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And if you know your history, your Old Testament history, the year of the Lord's favor in verse 2, what? That's nothing like this. That means the year of. Verse 20, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your ear. That's a prophecy from Isaiah. In Isaiah 61, it reads differently when we read Isaiah 61. And that's because um, when Jesus read this, he was reading from the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament uh, during this time. So he read in the Greek, in Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 2, we read in the NIV, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the broken heart of which he didn't read, which was not in the subject. To proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, which sort of was combined in the store mind. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, which we don't find in what Jesus read. To comfort all who mourn, which also wasn't in what Jesus read. But here's the thing. And here's the more important thing. That when Jesus read that, he, he, he announced the beginning of his ministry, which he already, already began by healing the sick and, and you know, casting out demons, but he made a proclamation that his ministry was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. So this was an announcement of Christ's earthly ministry, proclaiming that Isaiah's prophecy was being uh, fulfilled at that time. And when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, Peter was empowered by the Holy Spirit to make a proclamation that that particular day was the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy. You see the parable? At the beginning of Christ's ministry, there's a proclamation saying that Isaiah's prophecy is being fulfilled. And at the beginning of the ministry of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, there was a proclamation saying that this is the fulfillment of the prophecy in Joel. Can you get the correlation between the two? Now, the funny thing here is the prophecy in Isaiah is a prophecy about a future jubilee, a spiritual jubilee. And as you know, Jubilee is the 50th year. So the year of Jubilee was a time when land comes back to the original owners. And all debts have been paid. So if I owed you anything, Herschel, you know, at the end of the 50, on the 50th year, all that has been paid back. Because she, I paid you through the produce. But the year of Jubilee 
was a return of farm property that has been leased. And God says in Leviticus 25 verses 23 to 24 that the reason he wants that to happen is because all the land actually belongs to him. The land belongs to God. And you cannot sell it. I'm letting you use it. And when you sell it, quote unquote, you're only leasing it to your brother. And so at the end of 50 years, all that piece, all that land is going to come back to the original owners. And the reason for that is God set the boundaries for every tribe. For every tribe, whether that be Ephraim or Manasseh or Judah or, or Benjamin or Gad or Dan, you know, he set the boundaries of each tribe. He said, you cannot give that away to any, anyone else because that's your property. I'm giving you that. You cannot sell it to anyone. You can lease it. You can sell it by leasing it. That's all. So the, on the year of Jubilee, all farm property came back to its original owners. Now we're not talking about city property. Within the walls of the city, that's a totally different thing. I'm only talking about farm property. So as far as agriculture is concerned, it comes back to the original owners. Secondly, the year of Jubilee was also a release of servants. Now let's say, for example, I didn't have enough money, and all I had was a piece of land. And so I sold it, or I leased it to her show. But that was not enough, because I owed something, some, um, some money to someone else. So I gave that money, and I'm left with nothing. I have a family, I need to feed my family. So what do I do? I indenture myself to him. I ask him, hey, can you take me in as one of your servants also? He says, sure, why not? You can tell the land for me. And I'll pay you. And I become a servant. Not a slave, but a servant. A servant who's worth my wages. At the end of the year of Jubilee, or at the year of Jubilee, all servants are released. And you know why? Verses 40 42, God says, because all servants belong to Him. Everyone belongs to Him. You cannot have another master. You can only have one real master. And that's God. So the year of Jubilee back then was a restoration. A restoration of all property. A restoration of your freedom. You're no longer a servant, but a free man. It's a restoration of your property, so you are no longer poor, but you have a provision from God. This is very important because when Christ declared the beginning of His ministry as a fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah, He was saying, hey, I'm bringing freedom, I'm freeing all the slaves, all the servants. I'm freeing everyone from financial debt. I'm freeing everyone. I'm giving you back what you're supposed to have. I'm giving you back what you lost at the garden. I'm giving it back to you. And all your sins, all your debts, So let's jump over to 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. And, and let me just introduce this, why I'm going here. Because when we try to understand um, the way the economy was in the early church, um, there are some scriptures that give us a clue as to why they did what they did. 2 Corinthians verses, uh, chapter 8 verse 9. This is a story where Judea came into a famine and and all the other countries throughout the Mediterranean, uh, they still they didn't have that famine. And so uh, what Paul said, he asked the uh, Greek churches and asked them um, if, you, if they could help the Judean church. And the Corinthians were one of the first ones to say, hey, we want to volunteer, we want to help out the Judean church. We're going to send some money. So in 2 Corinthians, um, 
Paul encourages them, hey, did you make a promise before and you haven't fulfilled that promise yet? And so he reminds them by saying that, you know what, verse 9, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. He came as a servant. He came as born in a manger to a poor family. And they sacrificed two birds. He became poor, gave up his glory in heaven, became like one of us, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Okay, and we're talking about the richness in our richness in Christ. And this is the reason. Verse 13. Our desire is not that others might be released while we are our best, but there might be equality. Now, when we hear the word equality, we hear in America, we talk about what? When we say equality. What do we mean when we say equality here in America? Without giving the introduction. 
and he expects the reader to know what he meant. The one who had too much did not have too much, and the one who had too little did not have too little. And apparently, you've got to be, uh, know the Hebrew scriptures to understand this. Go back to Exodus. The story about the man. Anna. How do you say that? Anna. Extra stuff that they had. They 
externality and say that they could give to those who are in need. And only for that reason. So are we going to follow exactly what they did? No. That's not the point here. The point here is equality. The point here is equality. This is an example of what the, the early church did to observe what the principle of equality. They gave because someone had me. They gave because they had extra. They gave because at another time they knew, as Paul said, someday they'll be the ones who need, who are needy. And someone else who were needy before is going to have, is going to be able to help. I think that's a very good welfare system. And if our social security system ever falls apart, we'll probably resort to something like similar, but not necessarily exactly the same. We're going to help each other, right? And the family, this is one thing I love about family, is that we help each other. Back home, when I was a young kid, if any of my, my relatives came over to our house, and stayed for like a month or so. I mean, back here in America, you probably get, kick them out. Hey, get out of here, we've been here a month. <laughs> but in the Philippines, no, I said, hey, you're always welcome. Mi casa, su casa. My house is your house. Your family members, they're welcome me. And I had it. I had a cousin who stayed with us for like an entire year or two. And she was working, and she helped out in the kitchen. That's all we expected from them. Not to pay, but just to be nice. Not to be nice. And that's, that's a nice way to treat the family members. And we are family. That's the point. We are family. So is there going to be... Is going to be, is there going to be something catastrophic happening this, this month, or next month, or this year? I have a guess. I have a guess. Yes. You know? But I believe that the year of Jubilee, the year of favor from the Lord, already began back then. And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit already began back then. See, we live in the age of freedom. We live in the age of favor of God. We live in an age of love of God being poured out to every person on God loves us. He wants the best for us. He doesn't want us to live in fear. And all these people who want to make us fearful about what's going to happen, I don't think that's what God wants. He loves His children. He loves each of us. And so, really, The only question that we should ask now is not whether whether the best is going to come tomorrow or the next day or some of us are going to be raptured, like I said once before. If you if you get raptured, please send me a text or so I know. <laughs> <laughs> don't need to call me, okay? I'm going to be like a text. But the only question we need to ask really is what, what is God leading us to do to take part in proclaiming this freedom? What are we doing as our part? Because we are God's children. God wants us to take part in His mission to the rest of this world. What are we doing to take part in what He's doing in proclaiming freedom? Now, you know, back in... And in the time of the emancipation, not all the slaves knew that they had been emancipated, right? The news didn't go out. And many of the uh, slaveholders did not agree with the news, the proclamation. So it took several years before everyone actually eventually found out, hey, I'm free, I just didn't know. It's time for us to go out there and, and share the news. 